church, I still hear the Lord saying, step out of your seat. Step out of your seat. If you just walked in the building, don't go to your seat. Don't go to your normal place.
together. Oh, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We're not here for anyone else. We're not here for the person next to you. We're not here for your social club. We're not here for your friends. We're here for an audience of one. We praise you. We praise you. The only thing we're going to do today is praise the Lord. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you.
sense the Lord has come because he has stepped into our Egypt. He's stepped into our spots of hurt, our spots of trauma. And that is why we celebrate this season. Because he has brought us out from despair. He's brought us out something to proclaim that no one else does, that our Savior has met us, a perfect, whole Savior has met us, and He became sin for us. He became all of our mess. Joy arise. Thank you. 
singing day and night, night and day, let incense arise. I just got a picture of angels just going, going around the four corners of this sanctuary. And as we were offering up our, our fragrance, he didn't say it had to be perfect. If you're sitting in this sanctuary and you're not perfect, you're in the right place. That doesn't stop you from praising Him.
as we were singing that, I just saw angels going around. This sweet incense going up. This sweet fragrance going up to him. So if you're here today and he's been just tugging on you, whether it be something in pre-service prayer or me constantly saying, he's saying, get out of your seat, get out of your seat. He's pursuing you.
having everybody close their eyes. Get in the space where you're just looking at God. You're just looking at Jesus. We're going to sing this last chorus. And I want you to just picture you locked eyes, not looking to the left, not looking to the right. And I stand, I stand in all you. And I stand, I stand. Just let your song rise to the Lord. Let your own song rise. Let your own worship rise. Oh, let your worship rise, church. Bring him your offering. He's looking us right in the eye. His eyes are cast upon.
know that your anointing breaks bondage. This peace in the room right now is because the anointing of the Lord is upon worship. The anointing of the Lord, His presence is inhabiting our praises, and it is doing what no man can do. It's doing in us what no decision, no willpower, no self-help book, no life improvement series, no strategies, nothing can do what the presence of God can do in our lives. And we are yielding to you, Lord. If you're yielding to the Lord, just say amen. <laughs> oh, you're making God smile. <laughs> Oh, Abba Father is so pleased with us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stay right here in this place of worship. We're going to have uh, prayer. We've got prayer for a few specific things. The Abelos family, Ramon and his tribe, some of them came down with COVID. Father, they're doing better, but we pray health and healing all the way. Peace in the name of Jesus. I was talking to Pam Byerly before service. She said, Butch had a hard day yesterday. Last night, I think she said, Father, he's watching at home right now. Touch him. Touch that man, Father. In your name, Jesus, heal Butch. All the way, Father. Thank you, Lord. Christy Jackson's father went to the hospital last week. Things are pretty serious. He's come back home and he says, I'm in the hands of God, whatever he wants. Well, God, we know what you want. So, Father, heal him. Make him whole and do a great work of faith. In Christy's dad, in your name, Jesus. Ray Morris is asking for prayer for his wife. She's had some medical things happening the last couple months. God, care for her. Strengthen Minerva in your name, Jesus. Touch her. And in the name of Jesus, we pray for Ray that's taking care of her. That is a man of God and a warrior on his knees. We break the spirit of isolation. He is not alone. We are with him. And you are with him, Jesus. Robin Schmaltz broke her foot yesterday. Comfort her. Be with her. Help John and Robin through this father. Heal it super fast and amazing. God, we praise you. Church, you remember baby Xander that we've prayed for a few times? The child was born, Jody, where's Jody at? Like a pound and some ounces, right? One pound and one ounce. One pound and one ounce. Baby Xander is off the ventilator. He's stable. The world spoke death over this young man. He'll never make it, they said. He's stable and he's moving from his like, I guess ICU type thing in the NICU to a regular NICU bed. He's regulating his body temperature. It doesn't say in my notes, what's he weigh right now, Jody? Huh? Three pounds? That's 300%. <laughs> That's so cool. God, you're awesome. We praise you. Glory to you, God. There's no one like you. There's nothing like you. No one can do what you can do, and there's nothing that can replace you. You are God, the beginning, the end, the Alpha Omega. There is no higher, no greater. Thank you, Father. If the Lord, turn the lights up just a little bit in the back there. House lights, let's see. I'll wait for you. There you are, okay. If the Lord has done something incredible in your life in the past, like, four weeks, will you just raise your hand? And would you just shout, hallelujah! hallelujah. Look around, look around, look around at everybody. Yeah, praise you, God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Have you ever just been in the presence of God and he just gives you that fullness of joy? Man, I am just rejoicing internally at how awesome he is and the way he is just making his presence so available and tangible. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are going to continue on, but we are not going to 
stop moving in the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Father, for this awesome time of worship. Holy Spirit, you are still in the driver's seat. And we're along for the ride. Hallelujah. Right after talking about baby Xander, born at just a, I mean, was it 20 weeks? 23. And they say that 24 is the earliest to be viable. 23 weeks. You, you could, that's true. You could, thank you, gentlemen. It's legal to get an abortion at 23 weeks. Did y'all hear me? You could have, that baby could have been aborted. It is wrong. This is the last day for the petition for the referendum to get the uh, heartbeat law on the books for next year for his, a public vote. It's in the family room. If you've not done that, put your name on it. Stand for righteousness. Abortion is not a political issue. It's murder. Amen? Amen. That is a stopped heartbeat and a broken heart in mama and the rest that are affected by it. So in the family room, this is the last day. Uh, put your name on that petition. You can just ugly cram it in one of the offering boxes. We'll mail it in for you. You can mail it in yourself. But today's the day, so do it. Put your name on one. Hallelujah. Whew. God's awesome. <laughs> we had is um, Vicky Donardo is in the room. I know there were so many Operation Christmas Child boxes. How many did we actually end up with? It's not in my notes. 362. We were shooting for 350 and we didn't, I don't know, some of us in the background were like, I don't know if we're going to make that. <laughs> How many are we going to do next year? 500? Sure. Y'all could do it. There's about 300 people here today. You could do the math. That's, that's doable. We've got a video we're going to uh, throw real quick. It's kind of a recap of uh, what we've lovingly termed OCC, which is Operation Christmas Child. I guess I spoiled the end of the video. I didn't know it was in there. That was exciting music. I like that. Children, you are invited to go upstairs. Your teachers are ready to rock and roll with you. Lord, would you just bless the kids? Oh, Father, this is your church. There's been prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that the children will be leading, not just in 20 years or 30, but soon. And we're seeing that here in worship, this group of young men that's up here every week, Father. Oh, God, anoint their classes. Write your words on their heart that they won't stray from you. God, I pray that you would reveal callings to them. Father, speak to them and make your word alive in their hearts. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Oh, it's such a precious, precious thing to me. Probably because we're raising a bunch of kids right now. But it's always precious. 
Hallelujah. I'm just going to pray again before I get started. Can't pray too much. Father, I thank you so much for your precious outpouring on this church. Oh, for the way that you've shown your face to us, Holy Spirit. Oh, this place is yours. God, I just ask that you would fill my mouth with your words. Somebody texted me this morning and they they said that they saw in the spirit that uh, my mouth was fat. And I had big fat lips. I didn't know how to take it till the end of the text. And they said, because it's full of the Lord's word. So, Father, we just we pray into that prophecy and we thank you, God, that your words would be on my lips and not mine. Not one person came here to see me today. And, and if they did, convict them, Lord, because it's not about me or anybody else. We are here to glorify you. We are here to minister to you, God. Help us to grow deeper today. Help us to grow closer to you. God, if there's anything that separates any of us from that intimate place with you, from looking deep in your eyes, from seeing when you're looking at us, Father, if there's anything that separates any of us from your face, Lord, I just speak that today is the day that that veil, that separation would fall because you've drawn us into that deep friendship with you. Pray that you would anoint your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'm so glad to be sharing with you today. Today we are going to focus on testimony. Right at the end of worship, I asked you to raise your hand if the Lord has been doing something in your life in the last three or four weeks. And I don't know, it looked like about 75 of you did. And it was very interesting because most all of you that raised your hand, it wasn't like this. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, you know, it was like this. Okay, that's how God is doing things in our lives. So if that was you, I'm not going to call you up right now. I'm going to give you like warning, but begin to prepare your heart to share that. Okay, at the end, we're going to line up. I'm telling you right where we're going. At the end, we're going to line up in front of a microphone here and give like bullet point testimonies of what God has done in your lives in the last month or so. So, not the whole story of my uncle's brother's neighbor had this dog, and then the dog ran off, and then my car didn't start, but then also this guy called me, and thought that, you know, no, just be like, I had this thing in my life that I did not know how I was going to get past, and God intervened two weeks ago, and everything changed. Amen. There's so many of those out in the room today. Amen? Amen. So you start preparing your heart, <coughs> excuse me, and I'll go with you. That's the only challenge of these clip-on mics is when you have to cough, we all get to share that experience. <clears throat> so, about a month ago or something, I was going to share on John 9. And guess what? We're doing it today. Amen. And it is not a stale word. The word of the Lord that God gave me in John 9 has just translated throughout this entire month. And I'm so excited to bring it to you. His word is timeless. The bread that he pulls out of the oven is fresh. I almost uh, asked Alyssa, I just didn't come together because kids and life and stuff. But my wife makes sourdough um, everything. You guys know what it takes to do sourdough? You get the starter in the fridge and all that stuff. Man, she makes sourdough bread that just, well, the service would be over if I had that out here. But I was going to have it out <laughs> sitting right here. <clears throat> In John 9, go ahead and open your Bibles. We're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to do this whole chapter together. Because it is an incredible story of testimony. It is a testimony of a testimony. This is John 9. Jesus' ministry had begun. It was lively and active. He had disciples following him. And he's, he's going here and there, and ministry is occurring all around him. So as Jesus passed by, verse 1 in John 9, I'm reading in the ESV. He saw a man blind from birth. And then Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, Hey, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because he's blind. And Jesus answered, It wasn't that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God could be displayed in him. 
Isn't it interesting how we rush to find blame in something? Whose fault is this, God? Every time that happens, our eyes are on the problem, and the problem, the problem, new word, the problem has become larger and more influential in our lives than God. Amen? The questions you ask matter. If you're taking notes, write this down. The questions we ask God matter. And as disciples, ask the wrong question. Whose fault is this is not the right question when you walk up on somebody that's blind. What could be done about it would be a much better question. And what Jesus does is he turns her attention back. He says in verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night's coming when no one can work. It's like a strike while the iron's hot statement. We're here now, fellas. Aren't you aware of what could actually happen? Jesus, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Having said these things, Jesus spits on the ground and he made mud with his spit. Then he anointed the man's eyes with that mud. And he says to the guy who has mud in his eyes, now go wash it off in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And I read that, I think, how much spit would be required to make mud? So, It's not a dignified moment that's happening here. <laughs> the foolish thing is to confound the wise. The blind man was sent, and his faith had to respond. Like, do you wonder if there was a place closer than the pool of Siloam? He could have wiped Jesus' spit mud off his face. You wonder how he got there? Like, was he kind of, he couldn't see. He's crusty face. Someone had to take him there, or he knew how to go find it. His faith plus obedience brought his healing. Jesus is basically saying, do what I asked you to do and you'll be healed. How many in this room have prayed for healing in your, in your own specific life that you needed healing? I know I have, most of us, absolutely. If you're not brave, you didn't raise your hand, we know you prayed for healing, we've all needed it. Okay. Sometimes we wipe the mud out of our eyes our own way. Sometimes things are hard. Life's hard. My dad used to say to me, he's probably going to watch this now or later. Hi, Dad. My dad used to say to me, life isn't like Burger King and you can't have it your way. Do you guys remember the Burger King commercials? You can have it your way. There was this big controversy. McDonald's did not let you choose the toppings on your burger. Burger King did. Y'all remember that? So I used to hear, it's not Burger King, can't always have things your way. Life's hard sometimes. Sometimes the Lord has put mud in our eyes. We're going to get to that in the bottom of this chapter. There's a profound truth in this, so hang tight to that. But sometimes the Lord has purposefully given us something to deal with, that he wants us to walk out in obedience. But we prematurely wipe it out, because that, that couldn't possibly be the will of God. You following me? The neighbors, those who had seen the blind guy begging, jumping back into verse 8, were saying, isn't this the guy that used to sit and beg? Because remember, he can see now. If you were blind your whole life and you suddenly began to see, I bet it would be pretty dramatic. Do you guys ever see the videos on, uh, online of like a baby when they get their uh, hearing aids turned on for the first time? and they freak out, and they're full of life and joy because they can finally hear their mama's voice. Okay, imagine being a grown man. You've begged your whole life, and you can see all of a sudden. He would have been level 10. Now, isn't this the guy that's been begging this whole time? Some of the people said, yeah, it's him. They didn't even recognize him. Others said, no, but he kind of looks like him. But the man, formerly known as the blind man, kept saying, I'm the man. And they said to him, well, tell us how your eyes were opened. And he answered, the man called Jesus, made mud. He anointed my eyes. And he said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I could see. That is the most 
bullet point testimony I think I've ever experienced. You guys remember Pastor Don's testimony? It was incredible. All of us that have been in the church a long time could probably repeat it. He would say, I was going downtown to get drunk and meet girls, and instead I found Jesus. That was Pastor Don, and he can expand on it, but it's literally the same. There's something really powerful. In the world, it's called an elevator pitch. Do you know what that means? It means you need to be able to explain yourself in the 18 seconds someone's willing to listen to you. Okay? This dude, formerly known as Blind Man, did it perfectly. They said to him in response to his perfect bullet point testimony in verse 12, well, where is Jesus? Where is he? And the guy says, I don't know. Do you see right away there's attempts to discredit this healing? That can't possibly be the blind guy. They're questioning his identity. Then it says, how did this even happen? And this guy is already beginning to have to defend his testimony. That's a big deal. Let's, this is where we're going to live for a little bit. See, the enemy wants you to give up your testimony. He wants to tear down the altars that you've built to God in your life. Yeah. Satan cannot take your testimony away. It's yours. But you can give it. You can let go of it. And that incessant whispering of doubt in your ears is Satan trying to get you to open up your hand and say, maybe it didn't really happen that way. Maybe, maybe my back just started feeling better. Maybe that cold just went away on its own. Maybe I just slept really good tonight because I did, not because I prayed. Maybe that job I got was because I sent out 400 resumes and it wasn't really the providence of God. Do you hear how the, 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 the former blind man says the man called Jesus? Amen. The man called Jesus. Yes. Where is he? I don't even know. The healed man, that's an impersonal way, impersonal way to refer to Jesus. He didn't even receive him as a Messiah yet. He wasn't even Savior yet. What he knew is, I was blind, now I can see, and it was that guy, and they call him Jesus. That would be like, Bill, okay, so you, right there, hey, Bill. They'd be like, hey, who's that guy that whistles so loud when he praises God? And I'd be like, I think his name's Bill. And I know you better than that, but it's an informal, impersonal way to refer to somebody. 13. Well, before we get into 13, even with that lack of connection to Jesus, he hadn't become his savior yet. This man is going, look, the truth of my experience is immutable. This happened. Nothing can change that. And it's good he was that resolved because it continued. 13, they, the crowd, the mob, the groups of people. Honestly, we all know where that's going brought this man to the Pharisees, the man who'd formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Heaven forbid. God heals somebody on the Sabbath. When Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, it was a Sabbath day. So the Pharisees, freaking out, again, emphasis added, again asked how he could have received his sight. And the blind, previously blind guy says, again, he put mud on my eyes. I washed and I see. Oh, I love the tone of that. The Pharisees said, well, this man that's done this must not be from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner heal somebody? And there was division among them. Instant critic. This isn't new. This has been around a long time. It's human nature. They were divided about how to even be critical. This didn't fit into their equation. The Pharisees were like the teachers of the law. And uh, this just didn't work in their world. And it actually upended the, the seat of power that they've established for themselves. Healings like this did not happen on their watch. Listen carefully. A critical spirit always operates in division. When God shows his presence powerfully, when his intervention is tangible, 
if there is a critical spirit that observes it, it will seek to take the focus off what God's doing and put it on people and then cause division. Do I have to say that again? We all got that. Good. 17. So they said again to the blind man, all right, blind guy, that you used to be blind, now you can see. What do you say about this guy named Jesus? Since he's opened your eyes, so now they're forced to admit, okay, it's really him and he can really see. So the, the formerly blind man says, he's a prophet. I, I can hear him going, I guess. <laughs> the voice of accusation. Okay, fine, if you can really see, who do you say he is? If we can't take away your testimony, and we can't discredit it, because you can see, how many fingers am I holding? How many fingers am, how many fingers am I? They, you know, can't take that away. Now we're going to question Jesus, and we're going to start trying to erode his identity in your life. Have we seen this pattern in our own lives? Amen. We're preaching this now because of what God's been doing here. It's so precious. We are not going to let go of our testimony. Amen, church? Amen. 18. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and they received his sight. Some of them did, some of them didn't, until they called the guy's parents. And he says, hey, parents, is this your son? Would you say he was born blind? Like a trial, okay? How then now does he see? His parents answered, yep, that's our son. Yep, he was born blind, 21. But now he sees, we don't know how, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him? He's of age. He's an adult. Let him speak for himself. Amen. Parenthetically, yeah, okay, sounds great, but... His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anybody should confess Jesus to be the Christ, they'd be kicked out of the synagogue. So his parents said, let's just ask him. They shuffled it off. Yep. Fear of man will intimidate you into ignoring or changing your convictions. So they are back to discrediting the man who'd been healed. And now, what? <laughs> what's? <clears throat> they're going to try to turn his parents against him. Yeah. Division. We've got to discredit this guy. We'll get his parents in on it. We'll intimidate. His parents are older. They don't want to have to reestablish standing. They don't want to face getting kicked out of the church and the instability that might cause. We can intimidate them into taking our side. Verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who'd been blind which wasn't really the second time. It was like the 47th time this guy's had to defend his testimony. And they said to him, give glory to God, because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They're attempting to separate Jesus from God, deny the divinity of Jesus, doubt, division, confusion, blurred vision, make it much easier for Satan to have us believe a lie because it, it obscures our thinking. So if Satan walks, I've talked about this in a month or so ago, if Satan walks right up to you and says, God doesn't love you, you're going to start refuting it because you know better. But if he can cloud your vision, if he can unfocus your lenses and you're seeing blurry, you're thinking blurry and you start accepting doubt, now you've got an open door for the lies. We've all met people <laughs> that have that uh, contrarian thing going on where you're like, hey, the sky's blue. And they're like, no, it's not. Hey, I'm wearing a green shirt. That's not green. The enemy loves to take truth and turn it into a lie or try to purvey it as a lie. He's the father of lies. Verse 25, the man answered, look, whether Jesus is a sinner, I don't know. He didn't know yet. One thing I do know was that I was blind before, and now 
I can see. Again, the power of his testimony. Why does it say in Revelation we overcome? The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You cannot take that away. I've shared the testimony many times of how our daughter Nora was healed. I won't share it again because I've shared it. I'll share it again in a couple months maybe. <laughs> I watched her breathing change miraculously before my wife and I's eyes. You can tell me anything in the world that you want. You can't take that away from me. You can't. I saw it happen. That's truthful. That's the power of our testimony. You could, and, and you know, church, it's so easy to get into like the wrong false con construct arguments and participate in them. You could talk about, you're trying to share Jesus with somebody or, you know, it's the holidays, right? So who all sat around with family members and things can be tense sometimes. Okay. Nobody had to raise their hand there. We know. Yep. So it's, the wrong way to look at it is, let me tell you all about Jesus. Here's the proper doctrine. You're not going to get anywhere but an argument. You know, nobody wins a debate. You just believe your side more, more fervently, and then they believe their side more fervently. But when you share your experience and your testimony, nothing can take that away from you. How many things can you chalk up to coincidence? When you have cancer healed and there's a scan here that shows it and a scan here that says it's gone. Come on. Here in 15 minutes, we're going to hear from you guys what God has done. No one can take that away. Man, I'm excited. I cannot wait to hear. <laughs> the man stood firm on what he knew that he could see, and he gave nothing away. It says in Ephesians 4 to give no ground to the enemy. None. Verse 26, they said to him, well, what did Jesus do to you? How did he open your eyes? So the healed man said, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> I had some heat on it. <laughs> and they reviled him. I'll bet they did. <laughs> Well, you're his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We're following a man. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. See, their eyes were to the past. That's what God did. Moses was an awesome guy. We could talk for months and months about all the things of Moses, but he was a man. He was just a man. What he did that was excellent, he did because he was anointed. But then in his days, he failed, and he didn't even get to see the promised land. He was a man. And yet they turned him into a figure to follow. Their eyes were on the past, what God did, not what he was doing right now. This is a, a deep thought. Nothing that God is doing now will ever take away from what he's already done. God cannot conflict himself. Nothing he's going to do now somehow invalidates or devalues his previous work. And that is a very important thing to stand firm on. In God's infinite nature, his works are still new every morning. I want his words for today. Because today's words are perfect for today. Part of the reason they are is they're built on yesterday's words. His timing is perfect for when he moves and when he releases things. In verse 30, the man answers. So where do we leave it off? We're talking about Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this guy, Jesus, the Pharisees, we don't know where he came from, come from. Verse 30, the man answered. Well, what an amazing thing. He's in full sarcasm mode, okay? Man, that's amazing, guys. You don't even know where he came from, yet he opened my eyes. These are the leaders of their church. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind man that was born that way. So if this guy weren't from God, he couldn't do that. Amen. They, Amen. I, know, I would have loved to have been in that room. So they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you're going to teach us. Get out. And they kick him out of church. <laughs> he took him to school and got kicked out for it. 
So what happens next in verse 35? Jesus heard that he got kicked out, so Jesus went and found him. <laughs> so awesome. And Jesus asked the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? It's another way to say the Son of God. It's, it's that his nature is divine. And the healed man says, and who is he, sir, that I could believe in him? Do you hear the openness in his heart? Yes. Yes. He just, he wants, this guy has, he's seeing clearly for the first time in his entire life, and he just wants to, he just wants to know. Jesus says to him, you've seen him, and it is he who's speaking to you. Come on now. Come on. He says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Oh, glory to God. You've seen him. The power of those words. I don't hear Jesus shouting that in that moment. I hear it. In the quiet tone. Like a father to a child. We have four young kids, you, you can tell, because they're up here and we're chasing them around constantly during worship. You know what kids do sometimes? Is they have bad dreams. And what's a kid do? A child, when they have a bad dream, they, they sit up in bed and they cry. And so Alyssa or I will rush in. Because you know the difference when it's like this nonsense, like, I want a glass of water. I just go to sleep. Is it morning? No, it's 9 o'clock. But when they have a bad dream, you, you know your children's cry, okay? The Lord knows your cry, church. He knows our cry, okay? And you hear the fear and the disorientation in your child's voice, and you rush in. Like there is, like, the Batmobile speeding to the scene of the crime and Superman flying and the space shuttle but then there's mom or dad going to the bad dream, and it's faster. Because your child is suffering. Okay? This is God's posture towards you. Just, just I don't know, a few nights or a week ago, Aaron had a bad dream, or our five-year-old daughter with the long red hair. And she's sobbing. And I rush in, and she was barely even awake. Okay? She's, like, out of it just kind of transitioning from her dream to reality. And she wasn't talking, you know. She wasn't ready to talk yet. She's just sobbing. And I said, do you have a bad dream? And she goes, uh -huh. And she's sobbing down my shoulder. And I say, I'm with you, Aaron. This is your daddy. And that is the tone of voice. It's Jesus right there. You've seen him. I'm right here. That has been the experience we've all enjoyed this month. You've seen him, church. You've seen him. He believed and he worshiped Jesus. He was blind. Look at the whirlwind. He was blind. He walked in obedience and washed the mud off exactly like he was told. He was healed. He had an incredible testimony that gave glory to God. And from angle after angle, it was attacked and there was persecution within it. But he held that testimony firm and said, all I know was that I was blind and now I can see. Amen. The faith rises up within you when you defend your testimony. Amen? Amen. It's clarifying, and it's a galvanizing experience. The healed man was light years ahead in humility and in purity and in integrity. As Alyssa and I talked over the last week or two in our home, we talk about church. We pray about church. We asked the Lord to speak to us. And she had these three words on her mind. 
And she just sent me, it's real funny, we send each other emails. It's kind of an uncool thing to do, I guess. But she's like, these three words are really strong in my mind. Humility, purity, and integrity. And when I think of this healed man that was blind and could see, I see the humility. Walking around with Jesus spit mud on his face. I'll go over there and wash it off. Absolutely. You know, he got strongly toned when he was being pushed around by the Pharisees, but not once did he really leave the bounds of humility. This was my experience is what he's telling me. The purity of his spirit was so evident in his interaction with Jesus and his integrity to not let go of what God had done in his life. The kingdom of heaven flung its gates wide open for this man. You know, we're working on our, uh, we're, we've begun building our house. Amen. It's really exciting. Some of you all know that that's happening in the background, but we broke ground on it a couple months ago, and man, it's so cool. It's on five acres, which means uh, it's out east in a rural area, which means there's gates. So whenever I get there, I don't have one of these fancy garage clicker things for my gate yet, someday. Right now, I have to undo a padlock. You can't gain entry to that property unless you open that lock. The gates of heaven cast wide open for humility and purity and integrity. Verse 39. Going to do the whole chapter. Jesus says, For judgment I come into this world, this is big, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Have you read that in your Bible before? It's in there. I promise. See, the more open we are, the more humble we are, the Holy Spirit pours out. But when we close ourselves, we posture ourselves against God. Pride says, I don't need you in my life. And that's been a common theme. That we're teaching into that right now. Verse 40, some of the Pharisees hear him say that. And they say, so... They kick the healed guy out of church. Jesus goes, finds him, tells him he's the Messiah, the Christ. The healed guy believes in him, and the Pharisees are three steps behind following Jesus around. Some of the Pharisees hear Jesus say that he will give sight to those who see, but those who see become blind. And they ask Jesus mockingly, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, in this ever so perfect, calm sharp tongue that Jesus has, meekness. If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But because you say that you see, your guilt remains. Amen. Who, uh, raise hand moment, works or has in any sort of the field of law? You can raise your hand. Alyssa has. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. There's a term in the legal world called plausible deniability. What it basically means is if you know something, now you know it. If it can be proven, you know it. So plausible deniability is this idea of not knowing something so that you can't be guilty or responsible to that knowledge. I explained that well? Good. You are accountable to the revelation you have received. Okay. When God reveals something to you, when he comes through in your life, it is to go far beyond you. Not only to change you, but it is to go out from you, bringing glory to him. This man that was blind was doing nothing but sitting down on the corner of some steps somewhere, holding some cup probably, hoping somebody would drop a little bit in it so maybe he could get some bread tonight. And then he was healed. There's a response required of that man. And it wasn't some rule somewhere he had to follow. His convictions drew out of him. Look, guys, I don't know what your problem is. I was blind. Now I can see. Amen. And that is the extent of his obedience in that moment. He doesn't know any more than that. That alone was enough to bring glory to Jesus. Right. Jesus became more known and drew more to himself through that situation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Not one of us has it all together. Not one of us, not one of us has got everything sorted out. What God calls us to do is simply say, this is what God did for me. And then he is glorified. We know in the word it says he resists the proud and he gives what to the humble? Grace. Just leave that with you. If you lack grace in your life, go find the pride and kill it. And you will see the grace return. When I say kill it, I mean kill it with fire. Weren't you ever a kid that did the lighter and the hairspray thing? Come on. I am not the only one that did that. Come on. This guy back here is like, yeah. <laughs> I never even started a forest fire. It was great. Pride takes that degree of a response to kill, though, because pride is insidious. Pride is like the root of every sin because it's saying, I think I know better than God. Worship team, come on up here. You guys remember a few weeks ago, <clears throat> we prayed that our eyes would see we prayed that lame would walk. We had a precious time of ministry. We prayed that lepers would be cleansed. That was uh, like sin that's hung on. That deaf would hear and we would have discernment. That the spirit of death would um, be broken and, and, and we would rise to life, uh, with life, and that we could speak good news. We have seen, without a shadow of a doubt, God pour his presence out fresh and anew on our church. And that doesn't mean it's done, okay? There's no business as usual here. The way we hang on to that is saying, this is what God did. Every time in the Old Testament, when, when the Lord came through mightily for Israel, right? When he parted the sea, when they had victory in battle, what did they do? They built an altar. So that, and it always says, so generation after generation after generation could remember. Dad, what are these rocks we walked by today? Let me tell you, son, six generations ago, whatever. Today, we need to build some altars. We're going we're gonna, to, in just a few minutes, I'm going to literally put this mic here. And we're just going to line up, okay? And again, it's not like story time with, with you. It's the bullet points of what God did. Amen? And we are just going to take turn after turn after turn of glorifying God. Church, when somebody says something that God did, we're going to celebrate our socks off. Because we're not clapping for them. We're giving glory and honor to the one that came through for them. Amen? Okay, are you ready? No one's chickening out, right? Right? Okay, good. Okay, if you've got a testimony to give, the line starts here and goes that way. Come on up. Come on. We're just going to do it. If you're going on, uh, if you if it gets too long, the band is going to get louder. You guys hear me? You got me in there? Okay. So they're going to just kind of like give it a 30 seconds or a minute. I'll put the mic down here. I'm coming. They're going to give it like 30 seconds or a minute. And if you just, you know, it's okay. Look, I ramble sometimes, right? <laughs> that was a kind response. So if it gets rambly, it's okay. They're going to get loud, and that will be your gracious cue. You know what? Look at this line. I'm going to have you all come up here. Because the cameras see you so much better. We just do the line this way, and it'll go back down that way. The cameras see you so much better, and everybody at home can see you. What's up, my brother? Hey. Tell us, Jerry. I what know, has God done? I know that I was on the deathbed, and he healed me. Mm. He healed me. Praise living, God. I am Hallelujah. living proof that God heals. Woo. And you are living proof that God answers your prayer. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Y'all st stand up. Join us in this moment. Go ahead. A ministry friend came from the Dominican Republic. She and her husband are having a little trouble. Well, her husband counsels kids that want to kill themselves. We did uh, warfare last Saturday with Sheila. Her name's Sheila too. And I must say, the Lord divinely healed in that situation. 
Oh. And she went from total panic and awful fear to praising God oh. and worshiping the Lord again. <laughs> <laughs> Restoration! Thank, Thank you, sir. Lord! This is, this is the couple that we went to Israel with and got, and he's, they're both in the mission field and they were been doing all kinds of ministry through the years, but have never gone to the mission field as a couple. So they did that this time and it's, God has gloriously released them and delivered them from, from the attack of the enemy. The other, the other thing is real quickly, we were losing uh, hot water. This sounds like a little thing, but it, it you know, and finally the hot water heater went completely out. We said, oh my gosh. Well, so we had somebody, I told somebody about it. He both installed it. We got money, money came in from the north, the south, the east and the west extra. <laughs> and the, and it's completely done. We have hot Ooh. water and you never know how much you miss it until it's, you lose it. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy Lord. Amen. Amen. If, if you guys, if you can't get up on the stage, I'll come to you. Amen. Amen. My testimony is that uh, a lot of y'all don't know, but I was uh, tied up and raped at the age of nine. And so uh, I had, that led me into drugs, alcohol, and all that. I, God Ooh. delivered me and set me free, but I still had some root problem down there. And Steve and his wife, Jody, and when Nathan them preached, that, that loud stream, if I don't know who all was here, they heard that real loud stream. It was the root of the rest of it coming out in Jesus' name. And I am free. <laughs> Several weeks ago, you um, said there was a shoulder. Uh, you prayed for the right shoulder and I said oh that's me and I couldn't raise my hand like this oh hallelujah I can reach up in the cupboards thank you Lord I am a caregiver by profession now and I've been asking God that I would be I would be able to reflect him more in my job not only in the marketplace but also at home when my son complained to me in october the last on my birthday that he cannot come to take me out because he and his wife had been fighting all the time and i and he asked me for prayer and i asked him to concede and take no offense because i told him Ephesians 25 that he should love his wife just like he loves his body, the way Jesus Christ loves his church. That's the truth. And that Whoa. he has to keep the right to be offended. And he will think of the love scripture. I, I texted to him that love does not seek its own right. It is not proud, proud. It, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And I said, if you love Jesus, that you do not see, how can you not? love your wife unconditionally that you share your house your life with and the following day he said they were celebrating in orlando he said mom thank you for your prayers and epilepsy and uh, in the beginning it was gone and then it came back to where I was having serious problems and uh, I found a prayer that I wrote when I was 10 years old and I got down the side of my bed and I prayed and uh, I stopped having my seizures when I was having one to two a month you know it really scared me where I didn't want to be and uh, I came to church here and I felt all the brothers and sisters that I have and I love you all y'all y'all come up and started praying with me and it brought me back and a month before i even had my surgery it was like gone and uh it was it was it was gone and uh i was healed by our father i had Praise Lord. cancer too and they were saying that uh given a chance that i'm gonna have to have the uh chemo well when i had it done no chemo was there. They said I was totally <laughs> and, uh, Woo! I got one more.
more thing though. I was just going through a lot of problems and not being able to accept something. And uh, I got prayers and uh, everything turned out not where I'm as happy as I could ever be <laughs> with my wife for things that I wasn't accepting that she was starting to do. And Lord, thank you. And I thank you all for the prayers that I was given. Thank you, Lord. The strength that I have now and the, the love that I have for my wife, the happiness that I have for my wife and what she does. Awesome. It just, it, it's, it's so wonderful. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. teach school and it started um, in early August and in October I had a student that had still never answered me um, and I was there, there's a lot of other issues with her too but she just never spoken to me and I finally looked at her one day and I said are you ever going to talk to me and she thought for a minute and went <laughs> so I was um, one time when we came up for prayer I came up with Susan Yoder and Jody Gehart and um, prayed and um, they said that I needed to anoint the soles of my shoes before I walked into class and to walk around the tables and anoint them and uh, take the authority that Christ had given me. And um, so now, like three to four times a week, I have to find a polite way to stop her from talking to me so I can start class. <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago, my vision was really bad and they couldn't correct my eyes anymore and they found out I had double cataracts um, and so I went in for surgery and I see perfect totally clear so so uh, last week I was playing soccer so I sprained my left ankle and uh, it was you know you're older and things heal slowly um, so I, I just prayed I, and I said, God, you know, uh, just touch my ankle in Jesus name, something simple. And, uh, that morning, the Monday morning I woke up, you know, it, it was still painful. I was kind of limping, you know, and then I just noticed that in the middle of the day, you know, I'm walking and there's no pain, you know, and <laughs> I can, you know, come up on my, my toes, you know, and it was just wonderful. I was just, so praise God. That's so cool. Awesome. We want to, so I want to hear from everybody. We have to keep it moving. <laughs> now, for some time, I've been putting my day-to-day -day needs and day-to-day -day interests above my Bible reading, and I wondered why things weren't really straightening out. Hmm. And then uh, maybe four or five days ago, I thought, maybe I ought to read the Bible before I do some of these other things. <laughs> and, uh, well, the changes have been phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. <I'm on. laughs> Thank you, Bob. I'm coming down, Doug. Look here. We'll keep it down here for a minute. You know, when we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony was prayed in pre-service prayer. Each one of these testimonies is like flaming darts into the enemy. We're just going to rejoice at his destruction today. August 13th, I went in for a cardiac uh, catheter laboratory uh, when I came out or when I woke up they said we're not gonna let you go home you gotta stay uh, <laughs> I had 100% blockage in two arteries I had open heart surgery the 16th the 18th I had a stroke and I wasn't supposed to live. I lost. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I, I lost the ability to speak. And it seems like I can understand you just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't swallow. I had to learn how to swallow all over again, but I'm, God is blessed, and um, I mean, you, I could go on, a, both lungs collapsed, um, and it's just, it's just been amazing. Would you be 
alive right now if it was not for God. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we prayed for you, brother. Hallelujah. I lost my job one day, and I got it back the next. <laughs> this is a, a praise that happened to me. Is the I I had the spirit of thievery, um, of uh, a demon that was attached to me. And one day, I remember what a friend of mine told me. He said, stomp your feet like you never stomped before. And I stomped my foot and I said, leave. And the minute I was, I was, and the, the devil told me, no, just go and take it. Just take this, take this. And the minute I, I stomped my foot and lift, I kid you not, I heard the clapping of, of crowds clapping for me. There were angels and Jesus, yeah. and Jesus said, that's my boy. That's my boy. I don't know if this mic stands tall enough, Shane. So God completely broke me it, like for the past two weeks and it's the best thing. I went through a cleansing. So, and everything like that. Uh, he broke stuff off me from 15 years ago, from abuse in the future, from hatred. So I I don't hate my brother anymore, which is the best thing ever. And I had no, I was literally just sinking myself into a hole and everything. He showed me that he, what he has for me in my life and it's unbelievable. And I have no pride. The, my, my pride is broken. So, what's, what's going to happen in the future is not for me. It's for God. And it's bring God. Up. Jump right up on that thing. Go ahead, buddy. Tell us what God did. Well, in the past, I'd be worrying about stuff a lot, like finances, bills, and also I've had something going wrong with my house like the air conditioning went wrong and i would get upset about everything and worry and then i would call my mom to tell me that i that these things are upsetting me these things are worrying me so then she said to me give it to jesus and i did and the worry went away and i felt better that that I gave all of my problems and all of my worries to Jesus and and he did help he did bless me with a good air conditioning company to fix my central air conditioning and it works great and after giving all of my worries about things in general to Jesus I don't worry <laughs> several weeks the verse that they overcame by the power of his blood and the word of their testimony has been uh, going through my brain I just in the middle of the night I'll wake up and think about that in the morning I think about that and I've and I have three sons that I have been just prophesying those words over and yesterday um, as Greg and I were driving down the road I got a call from my um, oldest son, Christopher, who called me and said, Mom, I just got to call and tell you something that God has done for me. <laughs> and it was just crazy because God helped him with some situations that he had been dealing with, some financial situations that he has been dealing with for several years between finance and the insurance company. And you know those can be hard. So, Praise God. My truck spare tire fell off and no one was hurt. <laughs> My testimony is 
that I share my kindness with my friends at school. I did my work done. I obey him. And I remember I left the backpack at the drama. But I cannot stay upset. I found the backpack at the drama. I learned my lesson. I obey him. Hallelujah. And you know what? I share kindness. I have my kindness and my courage, my confidence. I told the devil to go away at bedtime. So hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Preach it. <laughs> Pastor. Pastor Chris. Hey, bro. I'm Chris. I apologize for being late this morning. We we met on Friday. Brent. Are you Brent? I am Brent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, dissension and untruth and disobedience and addiction with one decision with myself and my wife it's just one decision it's 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 gone we were blind and and i can see 2020. <laughs> something um generationally um i come from a preacher's family and uh just the enemy has worked over time in our family and in my life but one thing i just want to say as far as the testimony goes when god has his hand on you nothing nothing not your own sin not your own decisions can separate you when he has chosen you when he has called you out he will he will bring you full circle. I tried everything. I've tried everything to, to, to question God. But, but I'll tell. I'll just real quickly. I want to say this. The best way I can describe it is He allowed my house to be demolished because it was built on sand, and He has begun to rebuild me, and He has restored my marriage, and He has restored relationships and things, and He continues. And it sometimes is painful, but if I just allow Him. If I just allow him, I've heard acceptance, obedience. I've heard so many things, root things, God. He will continue to do that work and he's doing it and we're allowing it. And it's amazing what he is going to do in our lives and what he has brought around us. So I just want to say. Thank you for the prayers of the saints. You guys keep praying for each other. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He knows, sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I called on Jesus last week. I said, God, I need some help. I feel so weary in this caretaking position. And I had a friend call that I knew from back in Columbus, Ohio, and that's over 40 years ago. He said, my wife and I, we just, we felt like we need to come down and just spend some time with you. They flew in Tuesday and they left Friday. And those were the three glorious days. I've never seen my wife so happy, just rejoicing. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He hears me when I call. How do you? All right, now. I thought I'd just close it out with. I broke this elbow 11 months ago. Had an infection the whole time. The enemy lied to me. Had me thinking some bad things. They took the bracket out seven weeks ago, and it's healed. <laughs> My son, Shane, was dating a woman who was an atheist, and in, during the time that he was dating her, he found out, she told him that she had ovarian cancer, and that she she's a director of nursing, so she knows what the procedure would be for this kind of cancer, so she didn't do anything, and of course she doesn't know to pray. And as Shane was telling me this, it, um, I got such a burden for this woman, I still not met her. Her name is Brandy. And time went by and he 
felt it was it was tearing up. He was giving her Jesus. He was praying for her. And uh, she said the only time she ever felt peace was when he would come and pray over her and he was trying to tell her that it was Jesus. So long story short, um, I just got a text from, I've been saying to him, Shane, can I meet her? I want to I want to pray for her. I believe God wants to, that the Lord has brought you into her life because he wants to save her soul and he might even just heal her body too. And he didn't want to do it. He didn't want me to meet her. He didn't think she would receive it from me. And he just texted me in church today and said, Mom, I want you to meet Brandy. So pray for Brandy that she'll come to know Jesus, that she won't perish. She believes that there is nothing for her and that there is no God. God, we come to you right now for Brandy. You are opening her heart. This is work no man can do. No woman can do. It is not of us. It's not carnal. It's you. You can change a heart. All we can try to do is arrange the meeting. So, Father, the meeting has been arranged. We speak life over this woman. We break the spirit of death upon her. We thank you, Father, that this will be the turning point for not only her heart, but Shane's as well. That they will both bow a knee to you and that you will be their Savior. In the name of Jesus, draw them unto you. We cannot wait to give you glory for this testimony. It's going to happen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's exciting. I bought an RV um, a year ago last July and from the first day we drove it off the lot we had a lot of problems some, some with the manufacturer appliance or whatever going wrong and then, and then with the service we had and I'm, I'm just not good at confrontation I wanted to say something to the owner and I don't want to say too much about all that but um, what got you? So I wrote this five-page letter I was going to send to <laughs> My wife says it's too harsh, tone it down. So it sat on my desk for about three weeks. And uh, over at Popey's where the men meet, one of the waitresses there that we witnessed to said her husband is over at this other restaurant off of uh, Palmer. And I should go in there sometime. And they got great pizzas and everything. So I go in. I just went in there to check it out and get a, a menu. And the owner of the company is sitting there. And he says hi to me. How you doing? I said, well, yeah. yeah. I, I, I said, well, I've, I've been needing, I, I want to have a time to talk to you about some issues. He said, well, sit down right now and talk to me. So I said, okay. So we talked and he said, you, you need to come over. I want to get with my serviceman and some other people and, and get this, uh, whatever it takes, we'll resolve it. And then he reached his hand out. He's a Christian. We Divine appointment. And uh, we got back from our trip. I'm at the gas station, gas up. He calls me. He says, I just got back from a trip. Have you tried to get in touch with me? I, I want to meet with you. I said, well, I'm right around the corner. Everything's been resolved. That's awesome. And I, I forgave him. It's all fixed. It's all fixed. God. Look. Healing shoulders, healing cancer, hot water heaters, RVs. Every, I almost said it to you, Steve. Where'd you go, Steve? Where's, where's he at? Every, you said this, Steve. Every hair on our head. Every one of them. It's easier for some of us than others. Every one of them. Every one of them. I had a really bad accident. I cracked open my skull and broke my neck. I died twice, and here I am. God you died me. twice. Here to the mic. I want to ask you something. Did you die twice? Yes. 
Is there anything wrong with you now? Is there any, did anything, uh, was there any lasting result of this uh, when you fell and you hit your head? I'm completely healed. Completely. <laughs> completely. <laughs> that was the exact word most of us were praying for you when you weren't here. Completely. All the way. Nothing would last. Hallelujah. So, thank you. Did you have something to share too, or are you up here with him? Come on now. Stick with your bro. He came up with you. So, okay, bro, right up in there. Uh, so, I had a test on Friday, right? And I sat down in my seat, ready to take the test. And five minutes later passed, I still didn't put my pencil on that paper yet. Because the devil kept telling me, you can't do it. Ooh. You're not smart. You're dumb. But guess what? The angels told me. The devil is a liar. And he's always going to be a liar. You're going to finish that test. You're, you're smart. Woo. You're not dumb. Yeah, man. And guess what happened? I got 100% on that test. And I'm still getting 100. The devil's always going to be a liar. And still going to be a liar. Never believe in the devil. Always going to be a liar. That's awesome, man. A dirty liar, too. He's a dirty liar. So, we've heard a lot. I know there's probably more out there, okay? That's amazing. Write these things on the tablets of your heart. Inscribe them and don't lose them. We did this to give glory and honor to God and that the rest of our faith could arise. But church, I am telling you, journal it, write it, stick it on your fridge, stick it on your bathroom mirror, and don't give any ground to the enemy. What God's done in your life is true, amen? We're going to go out praising him today one more time. See you next week. I love you.
out into this week and we carry the testimonies on our hearts. And we are going to share the testimonies of what you are done in our communities and in our places that we come, in our grocery stores and everywhere we go. And so we just worship you and we go out with praise. In Jesus' name, amen.